Hi, my name is Connor McHugh. I teach philosophy at the University of Southampton. And in this video, I'm going to talk about moral responsibility and alternative possibilities. One of the central features of human life is that we hold each other morally responsible for our actions. This means that we're subject to certain kinds of reactions for what we do. Reactions like blame or praise, resentment, or gratitude, even punishment or reward. For example, suppose I'm in my car and you're on the footpath and I swerve into a puddle and drench you. In that case, I'm subject to blame and resentment. I deserve those reactions. I might even deserve to be punished for what I did. By contrast, if a rock fell into a puddle and drenched you, the rock would not be subject to those sorts of reactions. So you might be unhappy, but it would be senseless to blame the rock or resent it. For a more positive example, suppose you're on fire and I swerve into a puddle in order to drench you and save your life. In that case, I might deserve praise and gratitude, perhaps even some reward. But a rock that simply fell into the puddle and drenched you and saved your life wouldn't deserve those responses. Now, even a human being like me is not always morally responsible for what they do. So suppose my car had malfunctioned and was out of control when I drenched you, or I was having a fit and had lost control of my limbs, or I was being coerced by another agent. In those cases, it seems I wouldn't be morally responsible for drenching you. I wouldn't be subject to those uh, reactions of blame and resentment and so on. So there's a question, what does it take to be morally responsible? Under what conditions are we morally responsible? What I want to think about here is one very influential partial answer to that question, which goes by the name of the principle of alternative possibilities. So according to that principle, a person is morally responsible for what they do only if they could have done otherwise. So this principle states a necessary condition uh, on moral responsibility, or a putative necessary condition. It says you're responsible only if you could have done otherwise. So that may not be a sufficient condition. It might be that other conditions also have to be met in order for you to be morally responsible. And the necessary condition that it posits is that you could have done otherwise. In other words, an alternative possibility was available to you. There was something else that you could have done instead. For example, in the first uh, puddle splashing example from earlier on, presumably I could have swerved around the puddle and avoided splashing you that alternative possibility was available to me. But if my car had malfunctioned or I was having a fit or I was being coerced, then it seems I can't but splash you. There's nothing I can do to avoid splashing you. I don't have an alternative possibility. Why believe this principle? Well, as we just saw, it seems to get the case of um, the puddle splashing right so I seem to be responsible only when I could have avoided splashing you. When I'm, for example, coerced, it seems I'm not responsible because coercion removes alternative possibilities. It leaves me with only one option. If I'm coerced into splashing you, then splashing you is the only option available to me. And more generally, this principle seems to make good sense of standard excuses. So excuses are considerations that we appeal to in order to plead that we're not responsible for something. And those excuses often take the form of things like, I couldn't help it, I had no alternative, there was nothing else I could do, and so on. Uh, and those excuses would seem to suggest that we're responsible only if, as it were, we could help it, or we do have an alternative, or there's something else we could have done. That is, only if we have alternative possibilities, or as we might put it, more than one available path. 
Now, for those reasons the principle looks pretty plausible, it's also highly significant. It's of course interesting in itself to understand what the um, conditions on moral responsibility are, but there's a further way in which this particular principle is important. So some philosophers have argued that if the universe is deterministic, if it's governed by deterministic laws, that is if the laws of nature always ensure that for any situation it must necessarily lead to um, certain effects, then we never have any alternative possibilities. There's only ever one path available, so the laws of nature fix the path uh, or the course that events will take, and there's nothing we can do to change that. And so nobody's ever morally responsible for anything they do. So when I splash you um, in my car, well, it, that was determined to take place by the prior state of the world and the laws of nature. There was no other path genuinely available to me. And so on this line of reasoning, I wasn't really morally responsible for doing that, even if you might have thought I was. Notice though that this reasoning assumes the principle of alternative possibilities. It assumes that having available alternatives is necessary for being morally responsible. So the principle is very significant because it's essential uh, for this line of reasoning that leads to kind of skepticism about moral responsibility. Okay, so that's the principle, and now what I want to look at is a line of argument that might lead us to reconsider this principle and reject it. So the principle might seem obviously true, uh, and it certainly uh, has seemed obviously true to many people and was largely unquestioned in philosophy for a very long time. But in 1969, Harry Frankfurt, a philosopher in the US, published a classic paper that convinced many philosophers that the principle is actually false. In that paper, <clears throat> Frankfurt presented an example that he claimed was a counterexample to the principle. So let's look at Frankfurt's counterexample. I've adapted the example a little bit, but this is basically how it goes. So Jones is considering whether to murder Smith. And Dr. Evil also wants Smith dead, but Dr. Evil wants Jones to kill her. Dr. Evil doesn't want to kill her himself. And he also wants to be discreet. So what Dr. Evil does is, unbeknownst to Jones, he monitors her deliberation. So he, maybe he puts a, a, a neural implant into her brain while she's asleep that can monitor her thoughts. And he arranges that if Jones should be about to decide not to murder Smith, she, Jones, will be compelled to murder Smith anyway. <clears throat> okay, so Jones is deliberating away about whether to murder Smith and Dr. Evil's device is monitoring her deliberation and is ready to step in and compel her to murder Smith should she be about to decide not to do so. But in fact what happens is Jones deliberates quite normally um, and decides for her own reasons to murder Smith and goes ahead and murders Smith with no interference whatsoever from Dr. Evil or his neural implant. So she remains entirely unaware of Dr. Evil's antics and they don't play any role whatsoever in causing her to murder Smith. Now, according to Frankfurt and many people uh, subsequently have agreed with him, this is a counterexample to the principle of alternative possibilities. Why is it a counterexample? Well, in this case, Jones is surely morally responsible for murdering Smith. 
after all, she did so entirely of her own accord. But nonetheless, Jones couldn't have done otherwise. She had no alternative possibility because Dr. Evil had arranged things so that were she about to decide against murdering Smith, she would have been compelled to do so anyway. So Jones never had um, an available option of not murdering Smith, although she was unaware of that fact. She didn't have an alternative possibility. She couldn't have done other than murdering Smith, but still it seems that she is morally responsible given that she um, deliberated normally and decided to murder Smith and did so of her own accord. And if that's all right, then it's not true that you're morally responsible for doing something only if you couldn't have done otherwise. So you can you can be responsible for something you do even though you couldn't have done otherwise. So that's why this case is supposed to be a counterexample to the principle. Now this case has become so famous that philosophers um, now talk about Frankfurt cases in general. These are cases with the same sort of structure as Frankfurt's counterexample, in which an agent seems to be responsible for doing something even though they couldn't have done otherwise. And the structure or features that these cases have are as follows. So an agent performs some action in the ordinary way, that is to say they think about what to do, make a decision and do it. Um, but there's some factor in the situation of which the agent is unaware that would have stopped them from acting otherwise in the way that Dr. Evil and his neural implant would have stopped Jones from uh, refraining from murdering Smith had she been so inclined. But crucially, that factor doesn't actually play any role, right? It doesn't make um, any difference ultimately. It doesn't get involved in how the agent comes to act and many philosophers think that in these kinds of cases, um, just as in the original Smith-Jones Dr. Evil case, the agent is morally responsible even though they couldn't have done otherwise. So what's the lesson from this? What do these apparent counterexamples show about the principle? Well, there's a difference between on the one hand causing an action and on the other hand making a difference to what else an agent could have done. And coercion and other excusing factors often do both of these things. So if, if uh, I'm coerced into splashing you uh, with my car, the coercion will usually cause me to splash you, so whoever's coercing me will cause me to perform that action, and at the same time it will make it the case that I couldn't have done anything else. So it will do both A and B. Um, what Frankfurt cases bring out though is that these two things can come apart. So in Frankfurt cases, uh, Dr. Evil's arrangements play role B, they make a difference to what else Jones could have done, but they don't play role A, they don't cause her to do what she does. And these cases suggest that it's actually A rather than B that matters for moral responsibility, contrary to what the principle of alternative possibilities says. So arguably the principle seems compelling initially because we don't make a distinction between A and B. So if this line of reasoning is correct, this is very significant. For one thing that changes our understanding of how coercion and other excusing factors remove responsibility so it's not by making it the case that an agent couldn't have done otherwise, rather it's by 
causing the agent to act in the way they do. So it's the way that the agent's action is caused rather than what else they could have done, if anything, that matters for responsibility, it would seem. And secondly, to go back to a point mentioned earlier, if the principle of alternative possibilities is in fact false, then this blocks the influential argument that I mentioned earlier for the conclusion that moral responsibility is incompatible with determinism. So maybe we can be morally responsible for what we do, even if the universe is deterministic. Okay, so I want to thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you'll enjoy continuing to think about these issues. Here on the screen are some study questions to guide you.